Hi, good evening. Welcome to Berlin Baptist uh, and Pastor's Bible Study tonight as we uh, answer some tough questions. We've been looking at as we look at the Word of God and just trying to find a way to answer these in our minds and hopefully help you in your in your daily lives. Uh, today I want to deal with the question simply this. Doesn't science disprove the Bible? I hear that a lot and I want to talk about that a little bit tonight. According to a recent Gallup poll, 47% of Americans believe that the Bible is the inspired Word of God, but that not all of it should be taken literally. So about 24% those surveyed say they believe that the Bible is the actual Word of God and should be taken literally word for word, while 26% view it as a book of fables, legends, just history, and moral precepts recorded by man. It's just something some some men wrote down, in other words. But by the way, this is the first time in Gallup's four-decade trend here, as they've taken the same survey, that biblical literalism has not surpassed biblical skepticism. It's kind of an alarming thing to think of. For example, in the mid-1970s through 1984, nearly 40% of Americans considered the Bible the literal Word of God. That number's been shrinking ever since. It's at 24% now. And those who believe the Bible is made up of mere stories, that amount or that percentage has doubled. Much of that change really has occurred in the last three years. However, the vast majority of Americans, still 71%, continue to view the Bible as a holy document of some type at least, believing it is at least God-inspired if it's not God's own words. But it appears that might change sooner rather than later because of the recent surges in skepticism. Here's a question. Why are so many abandoning their previous ideas about the Scripture? Or at least why is the younger generation, uh, that of course many are now beginning to answer these questions, why are they adopting these skeptical ideas? I believe one of the reasons is simply this. One of the reasons that this, the, our country is going that direction is a false idea that's very prevalent today, and that is this question we started with tonight, that science actually disproves the Bible. People hear that, and I remember uh, in class sometimes I'd ask my students um, about that, and they would tell me about someone that told them. Maybe there's an uncle there in the family that shows up at family gatherings or whatever, and, and there'd be someone who said, no, I don't, I don't believe the Bible is the Word of God. I think it's just made up. And I'd always ask them, say, if somebody says that, ask them why they believe that to be true. And I find out that most people who are making statements like that really can't tell you a reason why. They just have heard something, and they choose, they, they would rather just go with that direction. There are others who hear misstatements or are been misinformed, and they, they take up on that as well. But over the last, at least the last 150 years, there's, there's been many attacks on the credibility and the infallibility of Scripture. The major denominations have been fighting the idea of inerrancy, that the Bible is without error, and infallibility, that is indeed, that is indeed the Word of God. They've been fighting that for at least during this, this time span. By the 19th century, Skeptics were beginning to try to point to evidence to try to disprove the Bible. Here's an example. In the earlier 19th century, skeptics were pointing to a lack of evidence of a Hittite civilization. At that point, there was no, at least they thought there was no extra biblical uh, evidence that the Hittites ever existed. Now, the problem is they, they believe that that therefore meant the writers of Scripture actually fabricated this existence. And so they were basically saying this, because we can't find the evidence for the Hittite civilization outside the Bible, then they've just made it up. So you can't trust the Bible as an historical source. Now, the Scripture mentions an ancient Hittite civilization more than 50 times. And it appeared that well, there doesn't seem to be a Hittite civilization, so there must be something to this. However, in the 19th and 20th centuries, archaeologists not only were able to identify extra-biblical references, that means references besides the biblical accounts, extra-biblical references to the Hittite civilization, they actually even found and they excavated the ancient Hittite capital, which is, was found in northern Turkey. 
Other compelling evidence for Hittite civilization was discovered in Egypt, and the Bible indicates it was a very powerful uh, civilization. So they have found the evidence for that. Maybe, just maybe, the Bible's critics spoke too soon, you think? That is an, ex that is an example of, of what someone would say, well, there's a scientific reason for not believing the Bible. Well, that one was supposedly a scientific reason, but yet it obviously didn't pan out. Another more recent attack on the Bible's credibility comes from the study of the DNA of the modern uh, Lebanese. This was, taken, uh, this was in the news back just a couple years ago. According to the American Journal of Human Genetics, more than 90% of the genetic ancestry of modern Lebanese is derived from ancient Canaanites. Now, here's the problem. Many people then, they point to God's command in the Bible, to Israel, to destroy the Canaanite population when they entered the Promised Land. So the conclusion is that since there's evidence for a Canaanite ancestry for among modern people, the scripture must be an error because it's obvious all the Canaanites were not destroyed. But all you have to do is actually read the Bible. You read the scriptural text and you'll find out that the Canaanites, according to the Bible, were not destroyed as God had commanded. So the point is, and it should be obvious, that those who want to reject the scripture will use every point they think is in their favor, even many times they have not adequately vented, vented these and really checked them out. Sometimes not even read the passages of Scripture carefully when they're making their claims. I'm not concerned at all that science is going to disprove the Bible. Not, not in the least. I don't care what someone comes up with. I believe that the Bible is the Word of God, and, and I believe there are solutions and answers. The problem is that many people who are on the fence uh, are using anything they can find uh, to not accept the Scripture as infallible Scripture. However, the most popular approach to discrediting the Scripture by using so-called science is coming from the promotion today of the theory of evolution. It's been taking place, once again, for at least 150 years. But not only has the credibility of Scripture been called into uh, into question, the, that evolution has become the main tool of not just questioning the Scripture, but it's become the main tool of atheism. Atheists such as Richard Dawkins like to point out surveys, and he does write about one that indicates that only 7% of scientists believe in the Creator God. And so the implication that he draws from that and is trying to express is that the smart people, for the most part, don't believe in God. No one wants to be called dumb or foolish or naive, and so right there is a, uh, a reason that many people will say, well, maybe there is no God. And so it's, it's, how, it's how the system is working. But the survey, actual survey that Dawkins is referring to, technically it indicates that 40% of the scientists surveyed did believe in the existence of God. That 7% were those who believed in a direct creation by God. I'm going to talk about that a little bit today, but the point is he was not truthful in saying that only 7% of scientists believe in God. So you find the statistics can be taken to kind of prove whatever a person wants to prove. Today I see a constant flow of information citing that evolution is a proven fact. I remember not too long ago being in a bookstore. Um, I like to go to the shelves that kind of discuss some of these topics, both pro and con. And I picked up a book and first page opened it up and said, evolution is a proven fact. There's no question to it. I'm thinking, how can you say that? How can that really be said? And once again, we're going to talk about that as we go along, but something to be proven in scientific terms is something that, uh, that you can observe and then that observation can be repeated. You can't do that with evolution. Evolution is a lot more than just uh, the, the reason for believing. It comes from not just from facts. In fact, there's no actual proven facts that you can show for it. But what is being taught in our schools and universities is that true science definitely proves that evolution took place and still takes place today. The earth is 4.5 billion years old, give or take. And if you dispute that, if you deny that, if you question that, well, man, you just, you just don't have it all upstairs there. You're denying science and you should be scorned and you should be mocked. That is the basic atmosphere in, in our society, in our culture today, in American society. If you stand up and tell someone you believe in creation, you believe in direct creation of God, you believe in the, in the literal six-day creation, I immediately, in the mainstream, you're put down as being someone who is 
He has not quite got it all together. Those who claim to be Christians have responded in various ways. So none of us want to be called stupid. None of us want to be thought to be less intelligent than anybody else. And so there are different ways that people respond to this. Many have embraced what we call theistic evolution. Let me just briefly talk about this. The theistic evolution theory basically accepts the teaching of evolution, some to varying degrees, but they will say, well, we believe that God started the process. So we believe that God used evolution, and uh, this is how everything came to be, but God is the one who started it. Some would say, well, God's the Big Bang, or He caused the Big Bang. God brought about or used evolution to bring about the universe and the earth as we know it today. This view is promoted by the Roman Catholic Church, for instance. The Pope came out not too long ago emphasizing that. that he said there's no problem between science and faith. I don't think there is either, but I don't embrace evolution as I say that. Many of the mainline Protestant denominations also uh, today would embrace, in fact, I would think that probably most of the mainline, if not, if not all, would embrace theistic evolution. And even many who claim to be evangelical, those who claim to believe the Bible is the inerrant, infallible Word of God, there are many who are today beginning to embrace this theory. I'm not trying to say tonight that you can't go to heaven because you're confused about origins. Entrance to heaven is based on what we do with Jesus Christ. But I am saying that accepting this teaching, it puts you on a very seriously slippery slope. First of all, the scripture says otherwise. The scripture does not really give room for evolution being uh, really what God's trying to describe or that God started and that type of thing. To accept theistic evolution, you have to believe that the Genesis account of creation, it's, it's either an allegory or a poem that was never intended to be taken literally. You'll have to come to that conclusion if you are accepting theistic evolution. In most cases, theistic evolutionists look at the first 11 chapters of Genesis. That starts with the creation. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth and goes on to the Tower of Babel uh, after the flood. So those 11 chapters, they are usually dismissed or uh, treated as an allegory by those who embrace theistic evolution. In other words, they don't believe that those events described in those 11 chapters actually took place. Now, the problem with that view is very serious. Jesus actually referred to, cre to creation, to Adam and Eve, and to the flood, which is recorded, obviously, in, within those 11 chapters. It's in uh, Genesis 6 through 8. Jesus referred to those as literal events. So you have the Savior referring to things that now we're trying to say, no, they really didn't happen. That's just an allegory. What well, was Jesus didn't know that? Uh, was Jesus confused or is he deceiving us? And really some serious questions. There is no biblical reason. Please listen to what I'm saying. There is no biblical reason to not assume the entire book of Genesis is to be taken literally. I've read some, uh, some good books by some good evangelical authors who are really uh, going that direction. And I'm saying there is no reason as you go to the book of Genesis to assume it's anything but literal. There's nothing in the text that demands that. The only reason someone would do that, really honestly, is to conform the Bible to the popular scientific teaching. Not because the Bible demands it, not because the Scripture demands it, not because it is inerrant in the Scripture, but because it, it fits in with what people are teaching today. Another very important issue is this. If man is the result of evolution, now think about this. When did he become a living soul? We know, biblically, this is a very important part of the biblical message. Man is a soul that must be redeemed. He has an eternal destiny, heaven or hell. That is so clear in the scripture. How can you believe anything about the Bible and not understand that? So it's very, very important. So if man is the result of evolution, when did he develop the soul? If man has evolved, now you cannot really accept part of the evolution theory. I know some would say, well, uh, everything else evolved except man. How does that fit in? Where are you getting this? So you use the Genesis account in reference to man, but not to everything else? I mean, none of that really makes sense unless you either take the entire Bible uh, message or you completely um, uh, ignore that. I mean, you have to decide which structure you're going to go. Did the soul evolve too? 
was that a form of evolution? That definitely does not make sense. It really doesn't. It doesn't fit into the biblical narrative. How can man be said to be created in the image of God? He definitely is. That's a very important idea to understand the human, that we have been created in the image of God. How could that be the case if we're the result of an evolutionary accident? It does not make sense. It does not add up. It does not fit into the scripture. There are other theories that try to explain the apparent vast age of the earth. That's what many are trying to do. Uh, one is the day age theory, uh, which uh, people would say, well, the uh, six days of creation, not meant to be literal. They actually could describe these vast periods of time. There's uh, so many problems with that. I would urge you today's um, study is not on these particular theories, so to speak. But I would challenge you to really examine the biblical record. Look into that. Another is the gap theory, which says that original creation is described in Genesis 1.1. And then there was some type of a catastrophic event and the earth was destroyed and God recreates it in the next, uh, the next verses there in Genesis 1. Genesis, so there's a gap between Genesis 1, 1 and Genesis 1, 2. Um, and therefore, they'd say that accounts for the vast period of time. We don't know how long the first creation was, etc. The problem is there's really no biblical reason for believing that. I really believe that these, um, these ideas or these theories are based on what is um, being taught in the science realm. They're, they're, uh, they're based on that rather than actual demanded by the scripture. The age of the earth, in so many cases, they understand this, it's, it's not based on scientific fact. So many people think this, that somehow that a scientist finds a rock and he's, he picks up that rock and he's got this little machine, he sticks it in somehow and, and he plays with some dials, and pretty soon here comes out the date of that rock. And so they have some type of magical way to find out the dates of these, these different things. That's not the way it works. The dating of rocks, the datings of fossils, all these types of things are based on assumptions and based a, upon the, the ge geologic age, the whole system that's been set up, which is based on the idea of, of evolution. So those who try to stretch the biblical narrative to accommodate the popular scientific thought Actually, they're creating both a scientific and biblical issues. Uh, most scientists do not agree with any of these. In fact, most scientists who are embracing evolution as a whole would reject theistic evolution even, especially the day-age theory and the, uh, the gap theory. But it, these also, these theories create some very, very serious biblical issues. Very, very serious ones. In my humble opinion it's just much simpler to take the Word of God at face value and believe what it says. Does the Scripture speak about this? You know what? I believe it does. Let me refer you tonight to 2 Peter chapter 3. We're looking at those first seven verses. Hope you have your Bibles with you. I'm reading from the New King James Version. If you have another version, it might even uh, be an interesting thing as you look at your version. Some of these words, it kind of gives us a... Uh, a way that we can compare and understand the meaning of them a little better. All right, I'm in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse number 1. Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm sorry, and of the Lord and Savior. So here's the introduction to this, to this chapter. Uh, this, uh, Peter is claiming the authority of the Word of God as he says this. So listen to his message. It says, Knowing this verse, the scoffers, another word for mockers, scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lust and saying, Where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they will willfully forget, that the word of God, by the word of God, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Peter was a common fisherman. He wasn't well educated. 
But through the direction of the Holy Spirit, he is going to write one of the most accurate descriptions of modern day skeptics that you can find anywhere. He mentions the scoffers. They're walking according to their own lust. These are immoral lifestyles. It can't fit in today in any better way, right? He then makes a very interesting statement concerning the mockers of truth. One thing they will be saying, he says, for since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue. It's a really interesting. All things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. In other words, the natural processes, everything around us is continuing as it always has. Today, that is known as uniformitarianism. And it's one of the me mechanisms for the evolutionary theory. That's why it's often called evolutionary uniformitarianism. In other words, perhaps you've heard the phrase, the present is the key to the past. So you want to find out how long it takes for, um, uh, for a rock to be turned into soil. All right, so we can measure uh, maybe over a period of a few years how much a, a little bit of that rock was worn away and we do the multiplication and so on and we come up with the millions of years it would have taken uh, for all the soil that we have in our, uh, on our globe, up on our earth to have been formed. So it's based upon those ideas. So many of the dating methods are based on this as well. The idea that we can determine what happened in the past by observing how things operate today, that's the basic idea of it. Now, there obviously is some truth that there is, uh, there are laws in which are uh, things that happen in nature, they observe, uh, if you could say it that way. But there is nothing, uh, in fact, what we're going to see is this, uh, there is nothing that, that requires, according to what we can see, what we can determine, that everything has continued in the same way that it always has. That is an assumption. The vast ages, therefore, they're given for the earth and the developments, the geologic age and all these types of things that have taken place on earth are based on an assumption of the veracity of evolution and uniformitarianism. It's based on those ideas. Now, let's face it. No one who's here today was around when the earth began, at least humanly speaking. It's also impossible to prove either evolution or creation by a scientific observation. When somebody makes a scientific proof, he has to be able to observe, repeat that observation to verify its truth, etc. We can't do that with evolution. We can't do it with creation. Your belief in origins, whether it's creation or evolution, either one, it's based on faith. Everybody's very quick to understand that when it comes to creation. They say, well, you creationists, you believe this by faith. You believe what God said in six days, the Lord God created the heavens and the earth, and so on. You believe that, and I do. I believe it by faith. I have not seen it. I have read it, and I believe it. Now, I believe the Word of God. So there's some credibility as far as I'm concerned. There's a record, but I know it's by faith. But I would say evolution is by faith as well. There is no way to prove that it happened. And the so-called proofs are simply based upon assumptions that have been made. Your belief on origins is based on faith. Now, does that mean there's no way to determine what actually took place? No, because God did give us a record of the events. And this is what's very interesting. I want you to note how Peter writes this. The simple fisherman is using some terms that in the 21st century, he's really pegging it. I mean, he's got it right down there. Peter tells us that the scoffers that he speaks of will willfully forget what it says in the New King James. Others will use the term they will deliberately forget. Or I think it's the ESV says they deliberately overlook. The King James says they willingly are ignorant of. All those phrases, very interesting. They describe how the scoffer reacts to things that he should know. There's two very important events. So there's two events that Peter says there's going to come people who are going to, they should know better than what they're doing. They make a choice to ignore these, these events. They act as if they did, have never existed or whatever. Those two events are the original creation, according to Peter, and a worldwide flood. It's not just that man's ignorant of those things, but rather he chooses to ignore even the possibility of these events. There couldn't be a creation, as the Bible says. You know, that's actually based on a presupposition of uh, anti-supernaturalism. 
That's someone who says, I just do not believe there is a God. Therefore, there can't be anything that's supernatural. Everything has to happen in a natural way. Well, if there's something that speaks contrary to that, they're not open or willing to even examine it. And that's the idea. Instead of uniformitarianism being the means of the earth and making the earth the way it is today, the Bible describes what we would call uh, catastrophism. And that's basically, by definition, the theory that changes in the earth crust during geological history have resulted chiefly from sudden, violent, and unusual events. Now, most evolutionists will admit that catastrophism has played a major role in shaping the world as we have, as that we see today. They know it's not a result of uniformitarianism, and they know it doesn't fit there, but it fits, uniformitarianism fits in the other things they want, to, they want to believe. But they still reject the biblical account. They'll say, well, yes, there must have been some type of a meteor that hit the earth or uh, the ice ages, and, and uh, that's what's caused these things. They do understand the idea of catastrophes taking place and forming the earth the way we see it. But Peter says, wait, you're missing two major events and you know that they're there and yet you choose to ignore them. The original creation, which is a sudden and unusual, never to be repeated event. So it, it fits the definition of catastrophic, right? And a worldwide flood. And if there had been a worldwide flood, the way the Bible describes in Genesis chapter 6, 7, and 8, if there had been a flood like that, the face of the earth would be affected in a terribly dramatic fashion. And I really believe it can explain so much of what we see in the earth today. If you want to know why the earth looks the way it does today, and why life exists as it does on this earth, then start by looking at biblical creation, and then the Noahic flood, which takes place generations after, of course, creation does. That is, that is a, a direction, that is a solution to this question that so many people uh, get confused on. Has science disproven the Bible? Not at all. Is there pressure in our culture to accept an evolutionary viewpoint? You bet there is. Definitely. But God has left us all the evidence we need to discover the truth concerning His creation. Now here's, a, here's what we are facing in our earth. You send your children to public school, they're not going to be taught that there could have been some type of a creation event that took place. They're going to be taught only the evolutionary viewpoint. If you know of a public school that actually allows someone to talk about creationism in a, in a good light, not mocking it and making fun of it, but actually maybe offering both views, I'd like to know of that school. I know of none that are doing that today. And so our children, uh, from uh, the beginning of their education all the way up, if they're in a public uh, uh, or a um, non-Christian even university, are going to be taught the evolutionary viewpoint. And with that idea, with that teaching, comes the concept, this is what educated people think. This is what educated people believe. If you believe something else, there's something wrong with you. That is why there's so many people who give in to this. And has science just proven the Bible? No way. There's no way. But I believe that God has left us all the evidence that we need to discover the truth concerning His creation. That in itself will be a tremendous uh, Bible study. We will be working on that as well. But let me leave you with this verse. It's Psalm 19, verse number 1. I believe we can know, we can have an assurance of, of God's creative work in our world. Psalm 19, 1, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows His handiwork. No science has not disproven, nor can it ever disprove the Bible. You can believe it. You can hold on to it. You can have that, that assurance deep down in your heart. The truth of the Scripture, everything it says is absolutely true. I hope that will help you and the spacious questions come your way. We will continue dealing with more tough questions concerning the Word of God, concerning Christianity. And I hope that you'll join us next week at 7 o'clock as well. And also, if you're in our area, we invite you to attend services with us at Berlin Baptist. We're at 15 North Main in Berlin. And um, uh, if you're not able to be here in person, uh, of course, we are also having... Um, 
our service is online as well, 9.30 on Sunday morning. So we hope that we'll see you then. Have a blessed week. God bless you.